Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Time Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems, the ones that you can't solve right now and will be easier to solve well rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story, but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. Before we go any further, I'd like to start out by thanking the supporters on Patreon. You all have helped me quite a lot to keep costs covered for the show, and it's much appreciated, because this is a hobby that I really enjoy. It's also nice not to be out of pocket for it every month, and um, to be able to help people get some sleep without feeling that I'm spending any resources from elsewhere that I shouldn't be. Uh, you will may have noticed, if you've been listening to the show for a while, that we've, uh, sounds are rather different. My new microphone actually arrived this morning, that is the... 17th of December. The success of the show so far has proven it's worthwhile for me to invest a little bit to upgrade and um, improve the quality. Those of you who supported me on Patreon and those of you who are listening alike are all people I'm very grateful to for. Well, I'm grateful that you're finding this helpful because I really do enjoy it. For people who are enjoying the show and would like to also provide a little bit of support on Patreon, you can check it out on patreon.com slash sleepytimetales. I'm not going to go into too much detail about what's available there, but there are benefits from $1 and $5 a month. So if you've got a little bit of something to spare, take a look and check it out. Uh, I am doing, up until the end of December, I'm doing two little things to try and encourage people to sign up though. The first one is everyone who signs up at the $5 level will get a fun postcard in the mail from me, something fun and touristy from Durban or South Africa, um, which you probably might find quite a bit interesting. And then also, if I hit $50 by the end of December, I'm going to do a bonus video episode, which will be released to all patrons, and I will release the audio of it as a bonus episode. Um, to regular listeners as well. I got a new review on Apple Podcasts. Unlike um, every other review I've gotten so far, it was a very bad one. It was not a good review, but I don't generally let reviews get to me. Most of the negative feedback I've gotten has been from people not liking the long intros and the promotional section and stuff like that. And I know who my listeners are and I know what my listeners appreciate. So that sort of thing doesn't really bother me. But it has, however, on the US iTunes store or Apple store, knocked my star rating down from five to four. So I don't often ask for reviews, but anyone who is inclined and is on Apple Podcasts or has access to Apple, um, if you wouldn't mind maybe doing a five star rating and review just to uh, help my score would jump up there a bit, it'll be much appreciated. Like I say, I don't take it overly personally, but uh, it's not nice to have um, someone who doesn't get the point kind of uh, run the average. And I don't have a lot of reviews, so the odd bad review um, uh, kind of, st- kind of um, has a major impact on my ratings. Um, and that's about that. Um, yeah, that's about that. If you are enjoying the show, and um, other than supporting through Patreon, the other major report that you can provide is just tell people about the show. If you are uh, finding the show helpful and getting some sleep or someone you know is help is getting some sleep and someone else is struggling, recommend it to them. Explain to them it sounds a bit of an odd idea and um, see if it works for them. Get, let them give, get them to give it a try. And that's basically the main thing is just like spreading the word. Money's nice and all, but at the end of the day, people need to listen. And uh, I feel like there's a lot more people I can reach and help. So if you can help me reach those people, that would be much appreciated. One other little note, at the end of December, I'm going to stop doing the little bonus episodes on Radio Public, the catnap episodes. Those will only be available on Patreon after December. 
So if you listen to them on Radio Public, uh, sorry about that. Um, and then enjoy while the last. I'm going to leave the archive up there for people to check out. But it's um, new episodes won't go up there in the future. And uh, last but absolutely not least, I would like to call out the music that I use. The song is called Un Désert. The artist is Komiku, a French electronic artist. Their music is available on the Free Music Archive. I've linked their website and their Patreon in the show notes as they have some very, very cool stuff that's released under different names that I recommend people check out. Uh, thank you, and back to the episode. So, what exactly is Sleepy Time Tales? What is it for? It's a bit of a strange idea, isn't it? A podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to. But lack of sleep is a health crisis in the 21st century, and this is a podcast that is intended to help those that it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night, with your mind spinning and your emotions in turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself just not quite able to doze back off at 3am? I'm here to help. My name is Dave, and I'm your narrator here to help you into a restful night. I'm someone who has struggled to sleep ever since I was a baby. My parents had sleepless nights with me for many years, and even once I got old enough not to bother them anymore, I was always struggling to sleep. It was fairly recently in life, actually, that I discovered the tendency for droning male voices to have a tendency to act almost like a tranquilizer for me and knock me out cold. And I figured that since I have a droning male voice, I'd do my part here to see if I can help other people. Now, every episode of Sleepy Time Tales starts with the, this, this um, long introduction. It's a bit of a controversial thing, but because not everybody likes it. But the people who've stuck around a while, it's, an, it's important for them. There's two purposes for this long intro, which takes about 15 minutes or so. And the first one is to explain the basic idea of the podcast uh, to new listeners, to people who've just, who've just joined us, and explain what it's for and how to engage with it. And for people who've been with me for a while, it's basically almost part of that process we that we're trying to do we're trying to create new habits for people we're trying to create the uh the, the, the sort of um habit or even ritual that will help people to get a good night's sleep because insomnia for many people is a bad habit that they've developed and it's something that we can do something about together but we need to do things over and over again to develop new good habits. We are, for all the listeners, this is where they prepare their space and prepare themselves and get ready to sleep. Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a space together here. Uh, And almost, what we're trying to do is build a space together here. A nest or a cave or a little cabin in the woods, whatever that'll help you to consider what which will help you to engage with her or help you welcome a sleepy night now as far as i know there's a couple of different ways to engage with the show the for me what i need with podcasts when i sleep at night is i need something actually to listen to i need something a story or event that lets me focus my mind on something specific so that that spinning mind that's uh tends to keep me awake at night, the stresses and anxieties are out of my mind, and I'm just focused enough not to resist sleep when it eventually comes for me. The second way for people to engage with the show is some people just need something like white noise. A droning male voice is the equivalent to the sound of a out-of-tune television or rain or the sounds of the ocean, whatever it is that um, helps some people to sleep. Now, the last couple of episodes and probably the next two are going to be slightly different formats for me. Because I work in the hospitality industry, I'm 
quite short of uh, time for doing prep and writing for the more original shows that I usually do. So what I've had to do is I'm doing cold readings of various stories to so that I don't leave my listeners hanging at the end of the day. It's holiday time and people are still trying to sleep and I want to be here to help. So what I'm doing here is very different to the usual formats and I'm interested if uh, it works for people. If you like this readings, let me know at uh, contact at sleepytimetales.net or comment on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. Maybe the, well, those three, those are the social media I use. Um, tonight's story is a bit of an interesting one because this is going out on the week of Christmas, a couple of days before Christmas Day. I'm doing a reading from L. Frank Baum's The Life of and The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus. L. Frank Baum obviously was the writer of The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. So expect something a little bit unusual. But whatever story I'm telling you and whatever else happens, the important thing you need to remember is sleep can't be forced. You can't force it. You need to welcome it. You need to keep a light mental grip on, on, the, on the thread of the story and allow sleep to come for you as when it's ready. Now, I'm hoping that you're asleep before I get to the end of the episode, but it's very important that you don't feel pressurized. It may not work on this first night if, there's, if you're new to the show. I would recommend giving it at least two or three nights to see if it works for you. If you can get used to the sound of my voice, my accent, to get over the idea of the strangeness of listening to a podcast that you're going to fall asleep to. It's also possible that one episode just isn't long enough. I know at least one listener who has to listen to two or three episodes a night, and it's uh, just the nature of their insomnia that they struggle with. But whatever happens, the most important thing is that you have got to try to relax. If you're new to the show and prone to late nights lying staring at the ceiling, it may take a while, even maybe a few days, for this to work for you. So queue up a few episodes or just run through the backlog. What I do with my sleep podcasts is I just let them stream all night. I lie down in the dark with my earbuds in and let them run. Sometimes I'll wake up at 3am and the stream is still running and the Voices are still there, and I just let them waft me back to sleep. Something that happens to me is I sometimes wake up 30 or 60 minutes before my alarm clock. What um, I do then is I usually also just carry on listening, and I can get another 30 or 60 minutes of sleep. And I've got to tell you, that 30 or 60 minutes can sometimes be the best part of my night. There's something about allowing yourself to relax completely right before the alarm that's Deeply, deeply satisfying. And so you have the basic idea. And so you have the basic idea. You relax and you lie in the dark. And while you do that, I'll tell you a tale. So relax, dear listener, my nighttime friend who has elected to lie in the dark, listening to my voice. You will always be safe with me. I'm here to help you relax to improve your life in a small way, or maybe not so small. People don't sleep very well these days, and it makes their lives harder. So I'm here to do my small part to help you in a big way, to help you to face tomorrow and the day after, well-rested and better able to cope. Now, something that's very important to me in this show, and something that's becoming important to me in life, although I've got to admit it's... As a person who's naturally sarcastic, it's difficult. Is I want to focus very much on kindness. I want to be kind to you. I want to share kindness with you. And most importantly, I need you to be kind to yourself. If you struggle to sleep, it's important that you don't beat yourself up or rebuke yourself over not sleeping. Don't get tense and don't get angry if you just can't get yourself over the edge of sleep. Even with me here in your ears, trying to help. Frustration is one of the greatest enemies of a good night's sleep. The intention with this podcast is to short-circuit that frustration. 
to distract the feeling we get when we blame ourselves for not being able to let go and to drift into the dark. So take a breath. Forgive the fact that you can't sleep and let my voice wash over you and under you. Take another breath. Imagine the warm darkness rising up, inviting you to sleep into a better life starting tomorrow. And, and if you can't let go, forgive yourself and try again tomorrow. If you've had a life of insomnia, sleep is something like an enemy. But it's not your enemy. That's a natural process that we've all been pulled away from by stress and life and little devices and progress that shine bright blue lights in our eyes at all hours. I'm here to work with you, to create a safe space, a cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course, you aren't hearing me, except maybe in a dream. The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus by L. Frank Baum Youth Chapter 1 Bursey Have you heard of the great forest of Bursey? Nurse used to sing of it when I was a child. She sang of the big tree trunks standing close together with their roots intertwining below the earth and their branches intertwining above it. Of their rough coating of bark and queer gnarled limbs of the bushy foliage that roofed the entire forest, save where the sunbeams found a path through which to touch the ground in little spots, and to cast weird and curious shadows of the mosses, the lichens, and the drifts of dried leaves. The forest of Bursey is mighty and grand, and awesome to those who steal beneath its shade. Coming from the sunlit meadows into its mazes, it seems at first gloomy, then pleasant, and afterward filled with never-ending delights. For hundreds of years it has flourished in all of its magnificence. The silence of its enclosure, broken save by the chirp of busy chipmunks, the growl of wild beasts, and the songs of birds. Yet Bursey has its inhabitants for all this. Nature peopled it in the beginning with fairies, nooks, rills, and nymphs, and as long as the forest stands it will be a home, a refuge, and a playground to those sweet immortals who revel undisturbed in its depths. Civilization has never yet reached Bursey. Will it ever, I wonder? The Child of the Forest Once, so long ago, our great-grandfathers could scarcely have heard it mentioned. There lived within the great forest of Bursey a wood nymph named Nasil. She was closely related to the mighty queen Zerline, and her home was beneath the shade of a wide-spreading oak. Once every year, on budding day, when the trees put forth their new buds, Nasil held the golden chalice of Ak to the lips of the queen, who drank therefrom to the prosperity of the forest. So you see, she was a nymph of some importance, and moreover, it is said that she was highly regarded because of her beauty and grace. When she was created, she could not have told. Queen Zeline could not have told. The great Ak himself could not have told. It was long ago when the world was new and nymphs were needed to guard the forests and to minister to the wants of the young trees. Then on some day not remembered, Nasil sprang into being. Radiant, lovely, straight and slim as the sapling she was created to guard. Her hair was the colour that lines a chestnut burr. Her eyes were blue in the sunlight and purple in the shade. Her cheeks bloomed with a faint pink that the edges of clouds at sunset. Her lips were full red, parting and sweet. For costume she adopted the oak leaf green. All the wood nymphs dress in that colour and know no other so desirable. Her dainty feet were sandal-clad, while her head remained bare of covering, other than her silken tresses. Nasil's duties were few and simple. 
She kept hurtful weeds from growing beneath her trees and sapping the food earth required by her charges. She frightened away the gadgulls who took evil delight in flying against the tree trunks and wounding them so they drooped and died from the poisonous contact. In dry seasons she carried water from the brooks and pools and moistened the roots of her thirsty dependents. That was in the beginning. The weeds had now learned to avoid the forests where wood nymphs dwelt. The loathsome gadgulls no longer dared come nigh. The trees had become old and sturdy and could bear the drought better than when fresh sprouted. Soon the seal's duties were lessened and time grew laggard, while succeeding years became more tiresome and uneventful than the nymph's joyous spirit loved. Truly the forest dwellers did not lack amusement. Each full moon they danced in the royal circle of the queen. There were also the feast of nuts, the jubilee of autumn tintings, the solemn ceremony of leaf shedding, and the revelry of budding day. But those periods of enjoyment were far apart and left many weary hours between. That a wood nymph should grow discontented was not thought of by Nessiel's sisters. It came upon her only after many years of brooding. But when once she had settled in her mind that life was irksome, she had no patience with her condition and longed to do something of real interest, and to pass her days in ways hitherto undreamed of by forest nymphs. The law of the forest alone strained her from going forth in search of adventure. While this mood lay heavy upon pretty Nasile, a chance that the great Ack visited the forest of Bursey, and allowed the wood nymphs, as was their wont, to lie at his feet and listen to the words of wisdom that fell from his lips. Ack is the master woodsman of the world. He sees everything, and knows more than the sons of men. That night he held the queen's hand, for he loved the nymphs as a father loves his children and the seal laid his feet with many of her sisters and earnestly hearkened as he spoke. We live so happily, my fair ones, in our forest glades, said Ak, stroking his grizzled beard thoughtfully, that we know nothing of the sorrow and misery that fall to the lots of those poor mortals who inhabit the open spaces of the earth. They are not of our race, it is true, yet compassion well befits being so fairly favoured as ourselves. Often as I pass by the dwellings of some suffering mortal, I am tempted to stop and banish the poor thing's misery. Yet suffering, in moderation, is the natural lot of mortals, and is not our place to interfere with the laws of nature. Nevertheless, said the fair queen, nodding her golden head at the master woodsman, it would not be a vain guess that Ack has often assisted these hapless mortals. Ack smiled. Sometimes, he replied, When they are very young, children, the mortals call them, I have stopped to rescue them from misery. The men and women I dare not interfere with. They must bear the burdens nature has imposed upon them. But the helpless infants, the innocent children of men, have a right to be happy until they become full grown and able to bear the trials of humanity. So I feel I am justified in assisting them. Not long ago, a year maybe, I found four poor little children huddled in a wooden hut, slowly freezing to death. Their parents had gone to a neighbouring village for food and had left a fire to warm the little ones while they were absent. But a storm arose and drifted the snow in their path so they were long on the road. Meantime the fire went out and the frost crept into the bones of the waiting children. Poor things, murmured the queen softly. What did you do? I called Nelko bidding him fetch wood from our forests and breathe upon it until the fire blazed again and warmed the little room where the children lay. Then they ceased shivering and fell asleep until their parents came. I am glad you did this, said the good queen, beaming upon the master and the seal who had eagerly listened to every word, echoed in a whisper, I too am glad. And this very night, continued Ak, as I came to the edge of Bursey, I heard a feeble cry, which I judged came from a human infant. I looked about me and found, close to the forest, a helpless babe lying quite naked upon the grasses and wailing piteously. Not far away, screened by the forest, crouched Shigra, the lioness, intent upon devouring the infant for her evening meal. And what did you do, Ak? asked the queen breathlessly. Not much, being in a hurry to greet my nymphs. 
but I commanded Shigura to lie close to the babe and to give it her milk to quiet its hunger. And I told her to send word throughout the forest to all beasts and reptiles that the child should not be harmed. I'm glad you did this, said the good queen again, in a tone of relief. But this time Nisil did not echo her words, for the nymph, filled with a strange resolve, had suddenly stolen away from the group. Swiftly her lithe form darted through the forest paths until she reached the edge of mighty Bursey, when she paused to gaze curiously about her. Never until now had she ventured so far, for the law of the forest had placed the nymphs in its inmost depths. Nisil knew she was breaking the law, but the thought did not give pause to her dainty feet. She had decided to see with her own eyes this infant's act had told her of, for she had never yet beheld a child of man. All the immortals are full grown, there are no children among them. Peering through the trees, Nasil saw the child lying on the grass, but now it was sweetly sleeping, having been comforted by the milk drawn from Shigra. It was not old enough to know what peril means, if it did not feel hunger, it was content. Softly the nymph stole to the side of the babe and knelt upon the sward, her long robe of rose-leaf colour spreading about her like a gossamer cloud. Her lovely countenance expressed curiosity and surprise, but most of all, a tender, womanly pity. The babe was newborn, chubby and pink. It was entirely helpless. While the nymph gazed, the infant opened its eyes, smiled upon her, and stretched out two dimpled arms. In another instant, Nasil had caught it to her breast and was hurrying with it through the forest paths. Chapter 3. The Adoption The master woodsman suddenly rose with knitted brows. There is a strange presence in the forest, he declared. Then the queen and her nymphs turned and saw standing before them Nasil, with the sleeping infant clasped tightly in her arms and a defiant look in her deep blue eyes. And thus for a moment they remained, the nymphs filled with surprise and consternation, but the brow of the master woodsman gradually clearing as he gazed intently upon the beautiful immortal, who had willfully broken the law. Then the great Ak, to the wonder of all, laid his hand softly on the seal's flowing locks and kissed her on her fair forehead. For the first time within my knowledge, said he gently, a nymph has defied me and my laws. Yet in my heart I can find no word of chiding. What is your desire, Nasil? Let me keep the child, she answered, beginning to tremble and falling on her knees in supplication. Here, in the forest of Bursey, where the human race has never yet penetrated, questioned Ak. Here, in the forest of Bursey, replied the nymph boldly. It is my home and I am weary for lack of occupation. Let me care for the babe. See how weak and helpless it is? Surely it cannot harm Bursey nor the master woodsman of the world. But the law, child, the law, cried Ax sternly. The law is made by the master woodsman, returned the seal. If he bids me care for the babe, he himself has saved from death. Who in all the world dare oppose me? Queen Zeline, who had listened intently to this conversation, clapped her pretty hands gleefully at the nymph's answer. You are fairly trapped, O Ak, she exclaimed, laughing. Now I pray you give heed to Nisil's petition. The woodsman, as was his habit when in thought, stroked his grizzled beard slowly. Then he said, Thou shalt keep the babe, and I will give it my protection. But I warn you all that as this is the first time I have relaxed the law, so shall it be the last time. Never more to the end of the world shall a mortal be adopted by an immortal. Otherwise would we abandon our happy existence for one of trouble and anxiety. Good night, my nymphs. Then Ak was gone from their midst, and Nasil hurried away to a bower to rejoice over her newfound treasure. Chapter 4 Claws Another day found Nasil's bower the most popular place in the forest. The nymphs clustered around her and the child that lay asleep in her lap with expressions of curiosity and delight. Nor were they wanting in praises for the great Ak's kindness in allowing the seal to keep the baby and to care for it. Even the queen came to peer into the innocent childish face, and to hold a helpless chubby fist in her own fair hand. 
What shall we call him, Nasil? she asked, smiling. He must have a name, you know. Let him be called Claus, answered Nasil, for that means a little one. Rather let him be called Neklos, returned the queen, for that will mean Nasil's little one. The nymphs clapped their hands in delight, and Neklos became the infant's name, although Nasil loved best to call him Claus, and after he days many of her sisters followed her example. Nasil gathered the softest moss in all the forest for Claus to lie upon, and she made his bed in her own bower. Of food the infant had no lack. The nymphs searched the forest for bell udders which grow upon the goa tree, and when opened are found to be filled with sweet milk, and the soft-eyed does willingly gave a share of their milk to support the little stranger, while Shigra, the lioness, often crept stealthily into Nasil's bower, and purred softly as she lay beside the babe and fed it. So the little one flourished and grew big and sturdy day by day, while Nasil taught him to speak and to walk and to play. His thoughts and words were sweet and gentle, for the nymphs knew no evil and their hearts were pure and loving. He became the pet of the forest, for Axe decree had forbidden beast or reptile to molest him, and he walked fearlessly wherever his will guided him. Presently the news reached the other immortals that the nymphs of Bursi had adopted a human infant and that the act had been sanctioned by the great Ak. Therefore many of them came to visit the little stranger, looking upon him with much interest. First the Rolls, who are first cousins to the wood nymphs, although so differently formed. For the Rolls are required to watch over the flowers and plants, as the nymphs watch over the forest trees. They search the wide world for the food required by the roots of the flowering plants while the brilliant colours possessed by the full-blown flowers are due to the dyes placed in the soil by the rills, who are drawn through the little veins in the roots and the body of the plants as they reach maturity. The rills are a busy people, for their flowers bloom and fade continually, but they are merry and light-hearted and are very popular with the other immortals. Next came the nooks whose duty it was to watch over the beasts of the world, both gentle and wild. The Nooks have a hard time of it, since many of the beasts are ungovernable and rebel against restraint. But they know how to manage them, after all, and you will find that certain laws of the Nooks are obeyed by even the most ferocious animals. Their anxieties make the Nooks look old and worn and crooked, and their natures are a bit rough from associating with wild creatures continually. Yet they are the most useful to humanity and to the world in general, as their laws are the only laws the forest beasts recognize, except those of the master woodsman. Then there were the fairies, the guardians of mankind, who were much interested in the adoption of claws, because their own laws forbade them to become familiar with their human charges. There are instances on record where the fairies have shown themselves to human beings and have even conversed with them but they are supposed to guard the lives of mankind unseen and unknown, and if they favour some people more than others, it is because these have won such distinction fairly, as the fairies are very just and impartial. But the idea of adopting a child of men had never occurred to them, because it was in every way opposed to their laws. So their curiosity was intense to behold the little stranger adopted by Nasil and her sister nymphs. Claus looked upon the immortals who thronged around him with fearless eyes and smiling lips. He rode laughingly upon the shoulders of the merry rolls. He mischievously pulled the grey beards of the low-browed nooks. He rested his curly head confidently upon the dainty bosom of the fairy queen herself, and the rolls loved the sound of his laughter. The nooks loved his courage. The fairies loved his innocence. The boy had made friends of them all and learned to know their laws intimately. No forest flower was trampled beneath his feet, lest the friendly rolls should be grieved. He never interfered with the beasts of the forest, lest his friends the nooks should become angry. The fairies he loved dearly, but knowing nothing of mankind, he could not understand that he was the only one of his race admitted to friendly intercourse with them. Indeed, Claus came to consider that he alone of all the forest people had no like nor fellow. To him the forest was the world. He had no idea that millions of toiling, striving human creatures existed, and he was happy and content. Years passed swiftly in Bursi, for the nymphs have no need to regard time in any way. Even centuries make no change in the deity creatures, ever and ever they remain the same, immortal and unchanging. 
Claws, however, being mortal, grew to manhood day by day. Nasil was disturbed presently to find him too big to lie in her lap, and he had a desire for other food than milk. His stout legs carried him far into Bursey's heart, where he gathered supplies of nuts and berries, as well as several sweet and wholesome roots which suited his stomach better than the bell udders. He sought Nasil's bower less frequently, till finally it became his custom to return thither only to sleep. The nymph, who had come to love him dearly, was puzzled to comprehend the changed nature of her charge, and unconsciously altered her own mode of life to conform to his whims. She followed him readily through the forest paths as did many of her sister nymphs, explaining as they walked all the mysteries of the gigantic wood and the habits and nature of the living things which dwelt beneath its shade. The language of the beasts became clear to little claws, but he never could understand their sulky and morose tempers. Only the squirrels, the mice and the rabbits seemed to possess cheerful and merry natures. Yet would the boy laugh when the panther growled and stroked the bear's glossy coat while that creature snarled and bared its teeth menacingly. The growls and snarls were not for claws, he well knew, so what did they matter? He could sing the songs of the bees, recite the poetry of the wood flowers, and relate the history of every blinking owl in Bursey. He helped the rules to feed their plants and the nooks to keep order among animals. The little immortals regarded him as a privileged person, being especially protected by the Queen Zeline and her nymphs, and favoured by the great Ak himself. One day the master woodsman came back to the forest of Bursey. He had visited in turn all his forests throughout the world, and there were many and broad. Not until he entered the glade where the queen and her nymphs were assembled to greet him did Ak remember the child he had permitted Nasil to adopt. Then he found, sitting familiarly in the circle of lovely immortals, a broad-shouldered stalwart youth who, when erect, stood fully as high as the shoulder of the master himself. Ak paused, silent and frowning, to bend his piercing gaze upon claws. The clear eyes met his own steadfastly, and the woodsman gave a sigh of relief as he marked their placid depths, and read the youth's brave and innocent heart. Nevertheless, as Axe sat beside the fair queen, and the golden chalice, filled with rare nectar, passed from lip to lip, the master woodsman was strangely silent and reserved, and stroked his beard many times with a thoughtful motion. With morning he called Claus aside in kindly fashion, saying, but goodbye for a time to Nasil and his sisters, for you shall accompany me on my journey through the world. The venture pleased Claus, who knew well the honour of being companion of the master woodsman of the world, but Nasil wept for the first time in her life and clung to the boy's neck as if she would not bear to let him go. The nymph who had mothered the sturdy youth was still as dainty, as charming and beautiful as when she had dead faced Ak with the babe clasped to her breast. Nor was her love less great. Ak beheld the two clinging together, seemingly as brother and sister to one another, and again he wore his thoughtful look. Chapter 6 Claus Discovers Humanity Taking Claus to a small clearing in the forest, the master said, Place your hand upon my girdle and hold fast while we journey through the air, for now we shall we encircle the world and look upon many of the haunts of those men from whom you are descended. These words caused Claus to marvel for until now he had thought himself the only one of his kind upon the earth. Yet in silence he grasped firmly the girdle of the great Ak, his astonishment forbidding speech. Then the vast forest of Bursey seemed to fall away from their feet, and the youth found himself passing swiftly through the air at a great height. Ere long there were spires beneath them, while buildings of many shapes and colours met their downward view. It was a city of men and Ak pausing to descend, led Claus to his enclosure. Said the master, So long as you hold fast to my girdle, you will remain unseen by all mankind, though seeing clearly yourself. To release your grasp will be to separate yourself forever from me and your home in Bursey. One of the first laws of the forest is obedience, and Claus had no thought of disobeying the master's wish. He clung fast to the girdle and remained invisible. Thereafter, with each moment passed in the city, the youth's wonder grew. He had supposed himself created differently from all others, and now found the earth swarming with creatures of his own kind. Indeed, said Ak, 
the immortals are few, but the mortals are many. Claus looked earnestly upon his fellows. There were sad faces, gay and reckless faces, pleasant faces, anxious faces and kindly faces, all mingled in puzzling disorder. Some worked to tedious tasks, some strutted in impudent conceit. Some were thoughtful and grave, while others seemed happy and content. Men of many natures were there, as everywhere, and Claus found much to please him, and much to make him sad. But especially he noted the children, first curiously, then eagerly, then lovingly. Ragged little ones rolled in the dust of the streets, playing with scraps and pebbles. Other children, gaily dressed, were propped upon cushions and fed with sugar plums. Yet the children of the rich were not happier than those playing with the dust and pebbles, it seemed to Claus. Childhood is the time of man's greatest content, said Ack, following the youth's thoughts. It is during these years of innocent pleasure that the little ones are most free from care. Tell me, said Claus, why do not all babies fare alike? Because they are born in both cottage and palace, returned the master. The difference in the wealth of the parents determines the lot of the child. Some are carefully tended and clothed in silks and dainty linen. Others are neglected and covered with rags. Yet all seem equally fair and sweet, said Claus thoughtfully. While they are babes, yes, agreed Ack. Their joy is in being alive and they do not stop to think. In after years the doom of mankind overtakes them and they find they must struggle and worry, work and fret to gain the wealth that is so dear to the hearts of men. Such things are unknown in the forest where you were reared. Claus was silent a moment. Then he asked, Why was I reared in the forest, among those who are not of my race? Then Ack, in gentle voice, told him the story of his babyhood, how he had been abandoned at the forest edge and left a prey to wild beasts, and how the loving nymph Nasil had rescued him and brought him to manhood under the protection of the immortals. Yet I am not of them, said Claus musingly. You are not of them, returned the woodsman. The nymph who cared for you as a mother seems now like a sister to you. By and by, when you grow old and grey, she will seem like a daughter. Yet another brief span and you will be but a memory while she remains Nasil. Then why, if man must perish, is he born? demanded the boy. Everything perishes, except the world itself and his keepers, on Sadak. But while life lasts, everything on earth has its use. The wise seek ways to be helpful to the world, for the helpful ones are sure to live again. Much of this Claus failed to understand fully, but a longing seized him to become helpful to his fellows, and he remained grave and thoughtful while they resumed their journey. They visited many dwellings of men in many parts of the world, watching farmers toil in the fields, warriors dash into cruel fray, and merchants exchange their goods for bits of white and yellow metal. And everywhere the eyes of Claus sought out the children in love and pity, for the thoughts of his own helpless babyhood were strong within him, and he yearned to give help to the innocent little ones of his race, even as he had been succored by the kindly nymph. Day by day the master woodsman and his pupil traversed the earth, Ack speaking but seldom to the youth who clung steadfastly to his girdle, but guiding him into all places where he might become familiar with the lives of human beings. And at last they returned to the grand old forest of Bursey, where the master set claws down within the circle of nymphs, among whom the pretty Nasil anxiously awaited him. The brow of the great Ack was now calm and peaceful, but the brow of Claus had become lined with deep thought. Nasil sighed at the change in her foster son, who until now had been ever joyous and smiling, and the thought came to her that never again would the life of the boy be the same as before this eventful journey with the master. Chapter 7. Class Leaves the Forest When good Queen Zeline had touched the golden chalice with her fair lips and had passed around the circle in honour of the traveller's return, the master woodsman of the world, who had not yet spoken, turned his gaze frankly upon Claus and said, Well? The boy understood and rose slowly to his feet beside Nasil. Only once his eyes passed around the familiar circle of nymphs, every one of whom he remembered as a loving comrade, but tears came unbidden to dim his sight, so he gazed thereafter steadfastly at the master. 
I have been ignorant, said he, simply, until the great Ak and his kindness taught me who and what I am. You who live so sweetly in your forest bowers, ever fair and youthful and innocent, are no fit comrades for a son of humanity. For I have looked upon man, finding him doomed to live for a brief space upon earth, to toil for the things he needs, to fade into old age, and then to pass away as the leaves in autumn. Yet every man has his mission which is to leave the world better in some way than he found it. I am of the race of men, and man's lot is my lot. For your tender care of the poor forsaken babe you adopted, as well as for your loving comradeship during my boyhood, my heart will ever overflow with gratitude. My foster mother, here he stopped and kissed Nasil's white forehead. I shall love and cherish while life lasts. But I must leave you to take my part in the endless struggle to which humanity is doomed, and to live my life in my own way. What will you do? asked the queen gravely. I must devote myself to the care of the children of mankind, and to try and make them happy, he answered. Since your own tender care of a babe brought to me happiness and strength, it is just and right that I devote my life to the pleasure of other babes. Thus will the memory of the loving nymph Nasil be planted within the hearts of thousands of my race for many years to come, and her kindly act be recounted in song and story while the world shall last. Have I spoken well, O master? You have spoken well, returned Ak, and rising to his feet he continued, Yet one thing must not be forgotten. Having been adopted as the child of the forest and the playfellow of the nymphs, you have gained a distinction which forever separates you from your kind. Therefore, when you go forth to the world of men, you shall retain the protection of the forest, and the powers you now enjoy will remain with you to assist you in your labours. In any need, you may call upon the nymphs, the rolls, the nooks, and the fairies, and they will serve you gladly. I, the master woodsman of the world, have said it, and my word is the law. Klaus looked upon Ak with grateful eyes. This will make me mighty among men, he replied. Protected by these kind friends, I may be able to make thousands of little children happy. I will try very hard to do my duty. I know the forest people will give me their sympathy and help. We will, said the fairy queen earnestly. We will, cried the merry rolls, laughing. We will, shouted the crooked nooks, scowling. We will, exclaimed the sweet nymphs proudly. But Nasil said nothing. She only folded claws in her arms and kissed him gently. The world is big, continued the boy, turning again to his loyal friends. But men are everywhere. I shall begin my work near my friends, so that if I meet with misfortune, I can come to the forest for counsel or help. With that he gave them all a loving look and turned away. There was no need to say goodbye, but for him the sweet wild life of the forest was over. He went forth bravely to meet his doom the doom of the race of man, the necessity to worry and work. But Ak, who knew the boy's heart, was merciful and guided his steps. Coming through Bursey to its eastern edge, Claws reached the laughing valley of Hohaho. On each side were rolling green hills, and a brook wandered midway between them to wind afar off beyond the valley. At his back was the grim forest, at the far end of the valley a broad plain. The eyes of the young man, which had until now reflected his grave thoughts, became brighter as he stood silent, looking out upon the laughing valley. Then on a sudden his eyes twinkled as stars do on a still night and grew merry and wide. For at his feet the cowslips and daisies smiled on him in friendly regard. The breeze whistled gaily as it passed by and fluttered the locks on his forehead. The brook laughed joyously as it leapt over the pebbles and swept around the green curves of its banks. The bees sang sweet songs as they flew from dandelion to daffodil. The beetles chirped happily in the long grass and the sunbeams glinted pleasantly over the scene. Here, cried Claus, stretching out his arms as if to embrace the valley, while I make my home. That was many, many years ago. It has been his home ever since. It is his home now. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales. The podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you to get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week. But make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get new episodes whenever they come out. 
a reminder that the music for tonight is Undeser by Kumiko. Check out more of their work on their website and their Patreon, which you'll find links in the show notes. Good night and sweet dreams.